The final nail in the coffin to actually prove the theory of evolution beyond the point that I, any decent, open-minded, scientific-minded person is um, going to be the parsimony. Now, we already talked about the fossil record with things like uh, evidence of extinctions of old species and appearance of new species, index fossils, mass extinctions, uh, transition fossils. Uh, fossils and living organisms which show evidence of homology structures, analogous structures, vestigial structures, and mosaic structures, both at the morphological or anatomical level, or at the physiological or even the molecular level at protein or DNA sequences. We also talked about embryo embryology and the study of similarity both in development and the activation of sequential activation of genes. We also talk about molecular biology and all the different ways you can use DNA to clock the evolution to create trees of life and relationships between anim animals and other types of organisms. You also talk about biogeography, studying both virus, bacteria, fungus, flora, fauna, and their distribution patterns across space and time as evidence for evolution. We also talked about microbiology and field biology, which actual evidence of microevolution or changes in virals or bacterial DNA and, and, and drug resistance. We also talk about animal microevolution examples, including uh, the peppered moth, uh, the guppies in the versus the selective predators, and the bugs versus the pesticides. We also talk about all of these things being evidence enough to support that evolution makes sense. That life is changing, and this is how it changes. But the final nail of the coffee is going to be parsimony. Now, when you get different theories are proposed, science says that the simplest explanation that fits the data should be accepted. Now, for example, when we're doing the, those uh, trees, uh, it's, it makes more sense to put the tree in a way that it groups the animals in a way that makes more sense. Remember, we talked about that where the, the similarities between the animals are aligned in a pattern that, that explains the data. Likewise, when you try to explain why animals are the way they are, why they do the things they do, where they came from, if in the face of all this fossil record, anatomical, embryological, molecular biology, biogeography, and actual evolutionary data from microbiology and field biological studies, if you're not going to use the theory of evolution, how are you going to explain this? Especially the fossils in the anatomy and the DNA data. If you're going to try to do this without evolution, you're going to have to come up with such a convoluted theory to fit this data that it's not just going to be work. Now, I know that it seems hard to understand evolution, and so it seems complicated, but to try to explain this data without evolution, then it's going to be complicated, I promise you. It's not going to make any sense. And I've, if you actually study those kinds of theories, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit the data. And even the ones that fit the data are so convoluted and hard that, you know, you got to go with the Occam's razor. Your theory is too complex. Cut. And that's why um, you cannot ex just deny the theory of evolution. Now, you, the origin of life may be... We can argue about that, even though there's a lot of evidence to substantiate that that too could have happened uh, the way the scientists think it happened. But I'm, I'm willing to concede that. But you cannot be ignorant and talk about a world where life does not change by natural selection. It happens. We've seen it happening. If I give you a Petri dish and we spray it with antibacterial soap, you're not going to kill every bacteria in it. Some of them are going to be resistant and are going to come back. And all of a sudden, your entire population is of resistant bacteria. Now, arguably, you didn't create a new kind of bacteria because the bacteria type was already there. You just, made a, you just changed the population. And that's just microevolution. But there's also evidence of new kinds of bacteria arising, like the viruses arising, because of the exposure to several generations of changes. And so microevolution is not necessarily at the beginning of a new species because you're not making a new species. You're just making whatever was already there become more common in the population. But that's still changes in the population. That's still evolution. Macroevolution is creating new species through this process over a long period of time. There is evidence for that as well. Anatomical evidence, fossil record evidence, molecular biology evidence, and even real evidence through bacterial and virus studies. 
And so it's, it's, it's really hard for you to deny the theory of evolution in face of this evidence, unless you blind and, and death yourself to everything that the, that the life is presenting you with. Okay? Uh, when we do one more step of this lecture series, we have to talk about the different types of evolution and then the myths about evolution. All right, guys, I'll see you guys then.